Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to your Reset Live Lectures. Dear friends, in chemistry today we will be continuing with the series on coordination compounds. In today's lecture we will try to understand the different theories that have been proposed to explain the formation and properties of coordination compounds. To discuss this uh, lecture we have with us our subject expert Dr. Shilpa Mehta. Dr. Mehta is assistant professor in department of chemistry in Ramjas College University of Delhi. Without further ado, I would like to welcome ma'am to our studios and request her to start the lecture. Welcome ma'am. Thank you so much Amrit. Uh, very good afternoon to all my viewers. Now in the last lecture we had on coordination compounds, we had understood the basic terminology that is used in coordination chemistry and then we went on to study the IUPAC nomenclature of coordination compounds both for polynuclear as well as mononuclear complexes. Now at this stage we should be able to write the IUPAC name of a complex if the chemical formula has been given to us and similarly we should be able to derive the formula from the IUPAC name of the complex. Now we will continue with the IUPAC nomenclature in this session also. And we will be talking about the Kappa convention which is used for specifying the donor atom of the ligand. And we will also learn how to name complexes which have metal metal bonds. Now over the years a large number of theories have been proposed to account for the formation and properties of complexes. So in this session we will be studying the Blomstrom theory which was modified by the Jorgensen and we will also study the Werner's theory of coordination compounds and there were certain limitations associated with the Werner's theory. So we will go on to the valence bond theory which tries to overcome these uh, limitations. So the Kappa convention, if you look at this complex of cobalt which has been shown in the slide, you will see that the complex has nitro group. Now nitro group is an ambidentate ligand, it can coordinate either through the nitrogen or through the oxygen. So in such cases what to do? We use the Kappa convention. So according to the Kappa convention, when there is more than one possible donor atom in a ligand, it is necessary to specify which donor atom of the ligand is bound to the central atom. And how do we do this? we use the symbol kappa, the Greek symbol kappa. Now the kappa symbol is placed after the portion of the ligand name that represents the ring, chain or substituent group in which the ligating atom is found. So you would place kappa before the atom which coordinates and the element is written in italics. So going back to our earlier example, if you look at this complex, uh, we have the cation which is a complex cation and a simple counter ion. So according to the IUPAC nomenclature, we would name the cation first. And the cation, uh, the complex cation has two ligands, it has amine and it has nitro. So alphabetically amine comes before nitro. So the name of the complex becomes pentaamine nitrito kappa n where n is in italics cobalt 3 sulfate. Similarly, the second example is a complex of nickel where nickel has a coordination number of 4. Now the ligand that is shown can coordinate through either 1 phosphorus through 2 phosphorus. So this has to be shown by the symbol kappa in the IUPAC name. So the IUPAC name of the complex is dibromido ethane 1 to diol bis dimethyl phosphane kappa p. Since we have used the symbol bis before kappa p, we do not have to write p two times, nickel 2. Now in the uh, ligand which is shown in this slide, which is acetyl acetonate, the systematic ligand name is 2,4-dioxo pentan 3-ido. Now we here you know you can coordinate, the ligand can coordinate through the metal through either one of those carbons. It can coordinate through either the carbonyl carbon or it can coordinate through the CH carbon. 
Now, when we use the kappa symbol, we write kappa before C, which is written in italics. But that doesn't solve the problem or doesn't tell us that which carbon is actually coordinating. So here we use or employ superscript numerals. Superscript numerals are based on an appropriate numbering of some or all of the atoms of the ligand and allow the position of the bonds to the central atom to be specified even in quite complex cases. So if the central carbon is coordinating, the name of the ligand to be used in the IUPAC name of the complex would be 2,4-dioxo, pentan, 3-ido, kappa, C, superscript 3, which implies ligation by the central carbon atom in the pentane skeleton. Now here you see a complex of rhenium. Now we have done polynuclear complexes in our last lecture, but there we had a bridging ligand which bridges the two metal atoms. If we look at the examples here shown in this slide, we see that the metal atoms are attached to each other. There is no bridging ligand available. So the name of these complexes would be named as other complexes are done by IUPAC. The only modification is that we have to specify the metals which are bonding to each other. So the metal-metal bonds are indicated in the names by placing italicized atomic symbols of the appropriate central atoms separated by an M dash and enclosed in parenthesis. After the list of central atom, names and before the ionic charge. So the complex of rhenium would be written as octachlorido direnate in brackets or parentheses we will write down rhenium rhenium since the metal metal bond is between the two rhenium followed by the ionic charge on the complex which is 2 minus. Now since this complex has some kind of symmetry also we can also propose an alternate name which would be the bis tetrachlorido renate, rhenium, rhenium, 2 minus. Now another example, such example is the carbonyl complex of manganese. Now this is named as decacarbonyl dimanganese. Manganese, manganese, the metal bond indicated in italics and enclosed in parenthesis. And because of the symmetry, we can also name it as bis pentacarbonyl manganese, manganese, manganese. Now sometimes what can happen is that instead of one metal metal bond, you may have more than one metal metal bonds. So in such cases, we have to specify the number of metal metal bonds in the complex. Now the number of metal metal bonds is indicated by an Arabic numeral placed before the first element symbol and separated from it by a space. So the example here would be cesium, which is a simple counter ion written first. Then we would write down do decachlorido, trirenate, and in parenthesis, three space followed by a rhenium rhenium in italics, and then the charge on the complex. Now coordination compounds have been known for quite a long time, and they have been used as pigments since antiquity. And perhaps the earliest known coordination compound is the red alizarin dye, which is first used in India. Now this dye is a calcium aluminate chelate complex of 1,2-dihydroxy 9,10-anthroquinone. Also the ligand uh, Prussian blue has been used by artists as a blue pigment and it has a composition potassium iron 2 CN6. In 1597, the first scientifically recorded observation of a completely inorganic compound was given by the German chemist, physician and alchemist Andrea Libavis. Description of the blue color formed when lime water containing ammonium chloride comes in contact with brass. It was later established that the blue color is because of the tetramine complex of copper 2. However, the sustained and systematic development of modern coordination chemistry began in 1798 with the discovery by French chemist 
B.M. Tasser that ammonical solutions of cobalt chloride developed a brownish magni color. Now, he could not, Tasser could not give the composition of the complex or he could not isolate the complex. It was only later it was found out that this complex which Tasser was referring to is the ammonia complex of cobalt chloride with the formula COCl3-6 ammonia. However, Tasser's discovery was important, his observation was very important because it gave a conclusion that even when two independently stable compounds, they combine together, they give a new compound which is stable and has properties which are distinct from the compounds from which it was originally formed. So as the number of coordination compounds increased over the years, a number of theories were proposed to explain their formation and their properties. In 1869, Swedish chemist Blomstrand proposed the chain theory for metal complexes. Blomstrand said that in the complexes, we have chains of ammonia. He was referring to again the cobalt chloride complexes of ammonia and he said that in these complexes the ammonia is linked by chains just like CH2 in the hydrocarbons. So therefore nitrogen in the complex would have a valency of 5. He was also able to give a relationship between the number of bonds and the oxidation state of the metal ion. So in these complexes, cobalt has an oxidation state of 3. So he said that in these complexes, we would have 3 bonds to the cobalt. Now Georgensen in 1875, he further developed Blomstrand's theory. He proposed that atoms or groups that dissociated into ions in solution were bonded through the ammonia chain. Whereas those that did not were bonded directly to the metal ion. So this slide shows you the structural formula proposed by Blomstrand. Now he said that if the complex is COCl3-6 ammonia, then we would have this structure. Now since in this complex cobalt has an oxidation state of 3, there are 3 bonds to the cobalt. And these three bonds are via ammonia groups which are linked in chains. Now experimentally the conductivity of these complexes was established and the number of ions were available. So the Blomstrand formula for the 6 ammonia complex showed that the three chlorides are ionizable since they are attached to ammonia and they are not attached to or bonded to cobalt. So hence in solution this complex would give us 3 moles of chloride and the correspondingly counter complex cation. So the total number of ions in solution is 4. Similarly, the second complex which has 5 ammonia would have 2 ionizable chlorides and 1 chloride directly bonded to cobalt. So the total number of ions in solution would again be 3 corresponding to the 2 chloride and the corresponding complex cation. The third complex which has 4 ammonia to attach to it has a structure in which only one chloride is ionizable. The, next, the other two chlorides are non-ionizable. So in solution we would have 2 ions and the 3 ammonia complex of cobalt chloride would give us 2 ions in solution. So his structure agreed with the electrical conductivities or the number of ions that were established for these complexes in solution. Now the basis for the modern coordination chemistry is largely because of Werner. Now Werner performed a number of experiments in the late 1880s and early 1890s on some metal chloride complexes of ammonia. At that time, for example, the cobalt chloride complexes, four of them were known. They were named because of their color. The orange colored complex of COCl3-6 ammonia is known as luteo. The purple colored complex of COCl3-5 ammonia is known as purpuro. 
The green colored complex of COCl3-4 ammonia is known as prasio and the violet colored complex of COCl3-4 ammonia is known as vileo. Now the last two complexes have the same uh, molecular formula but we can see that their properties are different. Uh, the one obvious property is the difference in the color. So Werner did two kinds of experiment on these complexes. In the first experiment, he took the aqueous solution of these complexes and treated them with excess of silver nitrate. So the luteo complex in solution gave 3 moles of silver chloride. The purpureo complex gave 2 moles of silver chloride and the prasio and the vileo complexes gave 1 mole of silver chloride. So Werner said that the number of silver chloride molecules or moles that were precipitated out is directly related to the free chloride that are available per mole of the complex. So if our luteo complex would have 3 moles of chloride, the purpureo complex would have 2 moles of chloride and the prasio and the vileo complexes each of them would have 1 mole of free chloride per mole of the complex. He also performed electrical conductivity measurements on the aqueous solutions of these complexes and found out that the number of ions per mole is roughly proportional to the electrical conductivities. So the luteo complex has 4 ions per mole, the purpureo complex has 3 ions per mole, the uh, prasio complex has 2 moles and similarly the vileo complex also has 2 ions per mole. So in 1900, in 1893, Werner proposed his uh, Werner's theory which explained these experimental observations. Now according to Werner's theory, the central metal ion in any complex exhibits two different kinds of valencies. We have the primary valency which is also known as the principal valency and the secondary valency which is also known as the auxiliary valency. Now the primary valency corresponds to the oxidation state of the metal. It is always satisfied by anions in the complex and if we show the structural formula of the complex, the primary valency species would al always be attached to the central metal by a dotted line. Also primary valencies are ionizable and they are non-directional in nature. On the other hand, the secondary valency corresponds to the coordination number of the central metal ion. The secondary valencies are either satisfied by anions or neutral molecules or both. Now here I would like to repeat that the coordination number implies the number of sigma bonds between the ligands and the central metal atom. Now if I were to show the secondary valencies in a structural formula, then they would be denoted by thick lines. The secondary valencies are non-ionizable and they are directional. By directional, it means that the species which satisfy the secondary valency, they are distributed around the central metal atom at fixed positions. Hence, they impart the geometry to the complex. While writing the structural formula of the complex, the central metal and the species satisfying the secondary valencies are written in square brackets to signify the makeup of the coordination sphere. The metal atom tends to satisfy both its primary and secondary valencies. In order to do this, sometimes the anionic ligands may have a dual role in satisfying both the primary and the secondary valencies. So uh, Werner, according to Werner's theory, then the luteo complex would be represented as CONH36 enclosed in square bracket and the corresponding chloride outside the square brackets. So the luteo complex in solution would ionize to give you the tripositive cation 
and three chloride ions. So this would correspond to four ions in solution and three moles of free chloride per mole of the complex which is in agreement with the experimental observations which Werner recorded for his experiments on precipitation and electrical conductivity. The purpuro complex would be represented by COnH35Cl and the Cl2 is outside. So this would give you the dipositive cation COnH35Cl and the two free chloride ions giving you a total ion number 3 and two free chloride ions. The prosio and the vileo complex would give you in aqueous solution CONH34 Cl2 plus and one free chloride ion which again corresponds to one mole of silver chloride when silver nitrate is added and an electrical conductivity corresponding to two ions. So, if cobalt has a primary valency of 3 and a secondary valency of 6, this is the structure Werner proposed for the luteo complex. Here the secondary valencies are shown by solid lines and the primary valencies are shown by dotted lines. So the 3 chloride satisfy the primary valency of cobalt and are shown by dotted lines whereas the 6 ammonia are satisfy the secondary valencies and are shown by board lines to the central metal atom. This is the Werner structure for the purpureo complex. Here we have three chlorides satisfy the primary valency and four ammonia, five ammonia along with one chloride satisfying the secondary valency. So here one anionic species chloride has a dual valency, both primary and secondary. Now this is the Werner structure for the prosio and the vileo complex. Here the three chloride ions are satisfying the primary valency and you have the four ammonia along with two chlorides satisfying the secondary valency. So here two chlorides have a dual role. They are satisfying both primary and secondary valencies. Werner's very important contribution is that he was able to assign geometric structures to many coordination compounds long before any direct experimental method could do so. For this purpose he used the method of isomer counting. So what he did was he synthesized and isolated isomers of a particular coordination compound for whose geometry he wanted to establish. And then on pen and paper he worked out the different kind of isomers that are possible for each one of those possible geometries. And then the geometry which on paper gave the same number of isomers as isolated by Werner was considered to be the geometry for that particular complex. So Werner first synthesized and isolated the two isomers of the tetraamine dichlorido cobalt 3 ion. Now for uh, as you can see here cobalt has a coordination number of 6. So for the coordination number of 6 there are 5 different kind of geometries that are possible. We can have a hexagonal planar geometry, a hexagonal pyramidal geometry, a trigonal prismatic, a trigonal antiprismatic and an octahedral geometry. So on pen and paper he was able to work out three isomers for the hexagonal planar. The isomers for the hexagonal planar geometry are analogous to the isomer found in disubstituted benzene that means ortho, meta and para. So here we have two chlorides at 1,2 position, 1,3 position and 1,4 positions. For the rest of the geometries that is hexagonal pyramidal, trigonal prismatic, trigonal antiprismatic, he was able to only work out three isomers on paper. For the octahedral geometry, he was able to work out two isomers. 
So this led to the conclusion or rather Werner gave the geometry of this complex to be octahedral. Similarly, he also synthesized isomers for the diamine dichlorido complex of platinum 2. He was able to synthesize and isolate two isomers for this coordination complex. Now the possible geometries for coordination number 4 are 2 which are the tetrahedral and the square planar. Now in a tetrahedral geometry only one isomer is possible because all the isomers are next, all the ligands are next to each other. Whereas for a square planar complex two isomers are possible, one in which the two chlorides are adjacent to each other and the other in which the two chlorides are at an angle of 180 degrees to each other. So based upon this observation, Werner concluded that the geometry of the diamine dichlorido complex of platinum 2 is square planar. Werner also was able to synthesize the first totally inorganic optically active compound called tris tetraamine mu dihydroxo cobalt cobalt 6 plus. Now because of this synthesis he was able to establish that optical activity in a compound need not be only due to the presence of a carbon atom. Even inorganic compounds can also be optically active. So for all his work Werner got a Nobel Prize in the year 1913. However, there were some shortcomings of Werner's theory. He was not able to explain some observations. He could not answer the question that why only a few elements form coordination compounds. He also wasn't able to explain the directional properties of bonds in coordination compounds and also could not explain that why coordination compounds have associated with them characteristic optical and magnetic properties. To overcome the shortcomings of Werner's theory, Pauling in the year 1930 proposed the valence bond theory. This was followed in 1950s by the crystal field theory and the ligand field theory which finally gave way to the molecular orbital theory. G. N. Lewis proposed the idea that atoms form covalent bonds by sharing pair of electrons. Walter Hitler gave the Hitler-London model which was the basis of VBT and the last step was the proposal by Pauling that hybrid orbitals are formed by the atomic orbitals mixing together. Now the valence bond theory is based upon some assumptions. It says that the central metal atoms hybridize together to give you uh, vacant hybrid orbitals which are the same in number as the atomic orbitals hybridizing together. The ligands have at least one sigma orbital containing a lone pair of electrons. The vacant hybrid orbitals overlap with the fill sigma orbitals to form ligand to metal sigma bonds and the geometric arrangement of the groups is determined by the type of hybridization. This table gives you hybridization for common geometries in the first row transition metals and in the next lecture we will be uh, applying uh, you know the valence bond theory for uh, coordination number 4 and 6. Thank you so much.
Good afternoon. Uh, in the last lecture on the series of coordination compounds, we had studied the different theories that have been proposed to account for the formation and the properties of coordination compounds. We had studied the Blomstrand and the Jorgensen theory. Then we went on to the Werner's theory of coordination compounds. And finally, we gave a brief introduction about valence bond theory. Now in this lecture, we will be continuing with the valence bond theory and we will learn how to apply valence bond theory for complexes and the examples which we will be dealing here would be coordination number 6 and coordination number 4. Then we would move on to the crystal field theory and we would understand the assumptions underlying the crystal field theory and then try to understand that what is the effect of a symmetric ligand field and an octahedral ligand field on the energies of the d orbitals. Now a very important part of valence bond theory is that the energy which is required for hybridization and the promotion of electrons or the pairing of electrons is uh, expended from the energy which is released when bonds are formed. So this slide shows you the inner orbital octahedral complex of a D5 metal ion. Now in this case the example that is being done is the hexacyano complex of iron 3. Now the ground state electronic configuration of iron is 3D6 4S2. So in this complex has iron 3 which has a ground state electronic configuration of argon 3D5. Now magnetic moment measurements help us to decide the number of unpaid electrons. Now from our last lecture we know that if a complex or if a metal ion has a coordination number of 6 then there are two kinds of hybridizations that are possible. The D2 sp3 and the sp3 d2. Now the magnetic moment measurements for this particular complex tell that it has one unpaid electron. Now since it has one unpaid electron this can be only explained by invoking d2 sp3 hybridization. So the two 4s electrons are paired up in the 3d orbital making available one unpaired electron and the two remaining vacant 3d orbitals, 1 4s and the 3 4p orbitals, they hybridize together to give you 6 d2 sp3 hybrid orbitals that then accept a non-bonding electron pair from 6 cyanides giving you the complex. Now in this complex of iron which is hexa aqua iron 3, the magnetic moment measurement studies have shown that it has magnetic moment corresponding to 5 unpaired electrons. Since it has 5 unpaired electrons, we have to invoke the concept of sp3d2 hybridization giving us 6 sp3d2 hybrid orbitals by the overlap of 1, 1 4s, 3 4p and 2 4d vacant orbitals. Then these hybrid orbitals accept an electron pair from water molecules giving you the hexa aqua iron 3 complex. Now this complex of cobalt has an oxidation state of 2 for cobalt. Now cobalt has an electronic configuration of argon 3d7 4s2. So cobalt 2 will have a ground state electronic configuration of argon 3d7. Now magnetic moment measurement studies have shown that there is one unpaid electron in this complex. So, we, uh, uh, so it was proposed by Pauling that one electron which is made available in 3d after pairing of the electrons in 3d is promoted to the higher orbital. Pauling did not specify which orbital it is whether it is 5s or 4d. So once that electron is promoted we have the availability of 2 vacant 3d, 1 vacant 4s and 3 vacant 4p 
which hybridize together to give you 6 d2 sp3 hybrid orbitals which give us an octahedral complex, an inner orbital octahedral complex of d7 metal ion. Now, if that electron is in the higher energy 5s or 4d, then that electron is unstable and should be easily oxidized. This has been proven by experimental studies. The hexacyano complex of cobalt in the oxidation state 2 is oxidized very easily to give you COCN6 3 plus, hence establishing that actually the hybridization that is happening is D2 sp3 hybridization. Now this is an outer orbital octahedral complex of a D7 metal line, again cobalt. Now here the magnetic moment measurements have shown that your uh, number of unpaired electrons is 3. So this can only be explained by invoking sp3 d2 hybridization and this complex has an outer orbital octahedral geometry. There are some complexes which only form or some metal ions which only form one kind of complexes. For example, if you look at the hexamine complex of chromium 3 ion, it has chromium has a ground electronic configuration of argon 3d5 4s1. So chromium 3 plus would have 3 electron in its 3d orbital. So we can easily have d2 sp3 hybridization. So there is no need to pair or promote. So chromium complexes are inner orbital octahedral complexes. On the other hand, nickel always forms outer orbital octahedral complexes. The ground state electronic configuration of nickel is argon 3d8 4s2. The nickel 2 plus will have a configuration of 3d8. So none of the 3d orbitals are available for hybridization. So therefore 1 4s 3 4p and 2 4d orbitals hybridize together to give you 6 sp3 d2 hybrid orbitals which give you an outer orbital octahedral complex for nickel. Now this slide shows you the tetrahedral complex of a d8 metal ion. Now the tetrachloro nickel complex has sp3 hybridization because you know nickel 2 has a ground state electronic configuration of 3d8. Now uh, the magnetic moment measurement studies have shown that there are two unpaired electron which could only be accounted for by having an sp3 hybridization involving 1 4s and 3 4p. Now the tetracyano nickelate complex of nickel 2 however has been found to be diamagnetic. So this diamagnetic behavior can be accounted for by pairing the two electrons in 3D giving rise to one vacant 3D, one vacant 4S and two vacant 4P which then hybridize together to give you four DSP2 hybrid orbitals which are oriented along the uh, square planar complex at an angle of 90 degrees to each other. In this tetracarbonyl complex of nickel, if you look at this complex, since the coordination number is 4, it can have either an sp3 hybridization or a dsp2 hybridization. So the 4s orbital should be vacant in either one of those cases. So the pairing of electron occurs in the 3D. Now uh, it has been shown to be diamagnetic, so therefore sp3 hybridization would account for the uh, tetrahedral structure of the tetracarbonyl nickel complex. Now valence bond theory has many limitations. First and prior is that it involves a number of assumptions. Secondly is that many octahedral complexes like the hexa aqua chromium 2 ion and the hexa aqua copper 2 ion are found to have a distorted octahedral geometry. That means the bonds are not all of equal lengths. However, according to VBT, it is expected that it would be a symmetrical octahedral geometry since all the bonds are formed by overlap of the metal with the D2 sp3 hybrid orbitals on the uh, metal and uh, the orbitals on the water. 
However, valence bond theory provides no solution for this observation. Complex formation generally is associated with a color change. Valence bond theory gives no explanation for this observation. Transition metals and coordination complexes are associated with a characteristic absorption spectra. VBT does not explain the absorption spectra of complexes. It has been observed that some ligands like chloride, fluoride, water, generally they form outer orbital octahedral complexes. On the other hand, ligands such as cyanide, carbon monoxide form inner orbital complexes. Valence bond theory could not explain this observation. Also valence bond theory could not explain the variations of magnetic moment values with temperature and also why the experimental value of magnetic moment is greater than calculated in some complexes. It could not explain reaction rates and mechanisms of reactions of complexes. It does not give a quantitative interpretation of the thermodynamic or kinetic stabilities of coordination compounds. Valence bond theory also could not explain the structure of the tetramine complex of copper 2. Now the tetramine complex of copper 2 has a coordination number of 4 for copper. So the geometry can be either tetrahedral or square planar involving either uh, sp3 hybridization or dsp2 hybridization. The magnetic moment measurement studies have shown that the number of unpaid electron is 1 in this complex. So automatically we would assume that it would have an sp3 hybridization since 1, 4s and 3, 4p are vacant. However, x-ray studies have shown that the structure is not tetrahedral. It is square planar. So to account for the square planar structure, we may promote one electron from the 3D to the higher 4p orbital, making available one vacant 3D, one 4s and two 4p for dsp2 hybridization. But if this were to happen or this was happening, then your electron which is in the higher orbital should be unstable and easily lost. So the tetramine copper 2 complex should easily be oxidized to the tetramine copper 3 complex like we did it in the cyano complex of cobalt 2. However, copper 3 is rare. So Pauling wasn't able to explain this structure. It was only later a person called Huygens explained that hybridization in this complex is sp2d involving 1,4s 2, 4p and 1, 4d orbital, giving rise to a square planar structure. The valence bond theory, because of its limitations, was largely replaced by the crystal field theory, which was introduced or proposed by a person called Hans Bethe in 1929. Crystal field theory was originally proposed to explain the electronic structure of metal ions in crystals where they are surrounded by the electrostatic field of the ligand and hence the name crystal field. It was only later it was applied for coordination compounds. The crystal field theory says that the interaction between the ligands and the metal ion is purely electrostatic. Subsequent modifications were proposed by Van Vleck in 1935 to allow for covalency in the interactions. These modifications are often referred to as the ligand field theory. One very important feature of scientific history is that the valence bond theory, the crystal field theory and the ligand field theory are contemporary developments. But it was only 20 years later crystal field theory was applied for coordination compounds. When it was discovered in 1930s, it was only used in solid state physics. So the assumptions of the crystal field theory are that the interactions between the metal ion and the ligands are purely electrostatic in nature. Both the metal and the ligands are regarded as 
point charges. So anionic ligands are regarded as anionic point charges and the neutral ligands such as water and ammonia are regarded as point dipoles. Water and ammonia have polarity associated with them because of the different electronegativities of oxygen and hydrogen for water and nitrogen and hydrogen for ammonia, giving rise to a dipole in these molecules. If your ligand is anionic, the interaction between the metal and the ligand would be an ion-ion interaction. If however your ligand is neutral, the interaction between the metal and the ligand would be an ion dipole interaction where the ligand is approaching through the negative dipole to the metal ion. And crystal field theory basically studies, now there are different kind of interactions electrostatic that can happen between a metal and a ligand. You can have electrostatic attraction which is there between the anionic ligand or the point dipoles and the metal ion. Then you have repulsions. There are different kind of repulsions that are possible. You can have repulsion between the metal D electrons and the electrons on the ligands. You can have repulsion between the metal nuclei and the ligand nuclei. And to a small extent, you can also have repulsions between the different ligand molecules. The crystal field theory focus is only on the effect of the repulsive interactions on the d orbitals of the central metal atom. So in order to uh, understand and apply crystal field theory, it is very important to understand the shapes of the d orbital. For any four lobed orbital, there are six wave functions that are possible. Now there are only five independent d orbitals that are known. So it is assumed that the dz square orbital is a linear combination of two independent wave functions which is of dz square minus x square and dz square. Now since both these orbitals have amplitudes along the z axis, the dz square has maximum amplitude along the z axis. Now the dx square minus y square also has some amplitude along the xy plane and the dz square minus x square has some amplitude along the x plane. So therefore your dz square also has some component or some probability along the xy plane which is indicated by a collar or a donut. The other orbital is the dx square minus y square. Now this orbital has maximum amplitude along the x and the y axis. Now the remaining three orbitals have you know uh, amplitudes not along the axis but in between the axis at an angle of 45 degree to the axis. So the first two which are dz square and dx square minus y square they are known as axial orbitals. Whereas the other three orbitals, the dyz, the dxy and the dxz are known as non-axial orbitals. The dxz has a maximum amplitude between the x and the z axis. The dyz has its lobes in between the y and the z axis and the dxy has its lobes between the x and the y axis. So let us first now consider the effect of a symmetric ligand field on the central metal atom in a complex. Now all of us know that the 5D orbitals in an isolated gaseous metal ion are degenerate. By degenerate we mean that they have equal energies. So if a spherically symmetric field of negative charges is placed around the metal these orbitals will remain degenerate but all of them are raised in energy as a result of the repulsion between the negative field which is because of the charges on the ligand and the negative electrons in the d orbitals. So this slide shows the increase in energy of the d orbitals because of these repulsive interactions. As we can see, the d orbitals still are degenerate, 
but they are higher in energy in comparison to the d orbitals in the free ion. Let us now study a case in which the six ligands form an octahedral complex. For the sake of convenience, we can uh, place the sixth ligand symmetrically along the axis of the Cartesian coordinate system with the metal at the origin of the axis. Now as the ligands approach along the axis towards the metal ion to form an octahedral complex, the d orbitals on the metal would experience repulsive interactions from the negative charges on the ligand as we saw in the spherically symmetric electric field. However, here there is a slight difference. Here the ligands are approaching along the axis. So as a consequence, the orbitals which have lobes along the Cartesian axis would experience greater repulsion than the orbitals which have their lobes in between the axis. That means the dz square and the dx square minus y square orbitals which are also called axial orbitals would be higher in energy in comparison to the remaining three orbitals dxy, dyz and dxz which are called non-axial orbitals. So now the d orbitals which would degenerate in an isolated metal ion would be split up into two sets of axial and non-axial orbitals. The axial orbitals are also called or denoted by Eg, whereas the non-axial orbitals are denoted by T2g. Now the origin of Eg and T2g lies in a branch of mathematics called group theory. The E stands for doubly degenerate and T stands for triply degenerate. The extent of separation between the T2G and EG is called the crystal field splitting parameter denoted by delta O or 10 dq. O here stands for the octahedral field. A better insight into the splitting in an octahedral field can be understood if we regard the formation of an octahedral complex as a two-step process. In the first step, the ligands approach and form a hypothetical spherical field, which increases the energy of the d orbitals equally. On going from step 1 to step 2, which is the formation of an octahedral complex, the d orbital degeneracy is split up into Eg and T2g. Now since the center of gravity or the Barry center has to be constant, the Eg orbitals are repelled or destabilized by 0.6 delta O, whereas the T2g orbitals are stabilized by 4 delta O or 4 dq. So now we try to understand that how do we fill up the configurations in an octahedral complex. Now if their configuration is D0, that means the central metal atom in a complex has no electrons, then it will remain vacant. If we have one electron, now we know that according to our electronic structure of atoms, the lowest, the electron would enter the orbital of the lowest energy. So here the T2g is lower in energy and the orbital, the electron would enter the T2g orbital. It can occupy any one of those degenerate orbitals of xy, yz and zx. For D2, again the electron would have two options, either to pair up or occupy a parallel spin in the other orbital. If it pairs up, it has to pay an energy penalty, therefore it goes to the other orbital in a parallel spin which is a consequence of Hund's rule. Similarly, the D3 orbital would have, the, the D3 configuration would have three unpaired electrons in T2g with a configuration of T2g3. Now I will uh, wrap up here, uh, in the next lecture we will uh, study the remaining configurations. 
of octahedral complexes. Thank you. So, uh, uh, we will talk about uh, D4 because there occurs some confusion in the D4 electronic configuration. And uh, because in the D4, we have to decide that where would the electron go? Would it go to a, uh, you know, a T2G orbital or an EG orbital? So, uh, the, the position of the electron would depend upon the relative energy of delta naught and the pairing energy. Thank you. Uh, dear friends, on that note, we would like to thank Dr. Mehta for coming to our show and delivering this wonderful lecture. And thank you, dear friends, for watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you. Thank you.